You might get a call one day, someone from one of the smartest new industries in the world. They say they're ready to help you with online purchases, tax payments, or even banking. They're scammers. They catch so many of us off guard. If it really is your bank, they'll never ask for your bank account details by text or email, and they'll never threaten to immediately cancel your account or arrest you. If they do, stop and think, then delete or hang up. Australia's banks are here to protect you. ABA research shows that 66% of Australians fend off a scam attempt every week and 29% say they fend off a scam attempt every day. 37% of us have lost money to a scam or we know someone close to us who has. And more than a third of us know someone who has lost more than $150,000 to a scam. So scams are very serious business. And I'd like to welcome you, uh, all of you here today, to talk about this issue uh, in a lot more depth. As we begin the session, I'd like to uh, welcome our guests, uh, Detective Superintendent Matt Craft, uh, who's here with me, uh, Commander of the Cybercrime Squad, and Dr David Lacey, who is the Managing Director of ID Care. ID Care is Australia and New Zealand's National Identity and Cyber Support Service. So, uh, gentlemen, welcome. Uh, as some of you know, Australia's banks have begun this week running an advertising campaign on radio and online and social media to remind Australians to be alert uh, and to protect, take steps where they can to protect themselves uh, from criminals seeking to scam them out of their hard-earned savings. Matt, I might start with you. Uh, it does feel anecdotally, talking to people, uh, that scams are on the rise. Um, and I'm interested whether you think, is, are we actually seeing an increase in this sort of activity? Look, absolutely. There's no doubt uh, from a law enforcement perspective, uh, we are seeing more people reporting uh, all manner of fraud and cyber related crimes. Um, but in, in particular, the research, uh, the ACCC research quite clearly indicates that in 2020, Australians nationally lost over $850 million to scams. Uh, and that also represented a 23% increase uh, in the funds that were lost nationally um, uh, to scams or all manner of scams. Um, the research also quite clearly indicates um, that uh, uh, investment scams, romance scams, and also to business email compromise scams um, are at the top of our list. So, the, you know, from my perspective, we're arresting more people, uh, we're intervening and preventing and disrupting more of this type of crime, but it's definitely on the increase. And is there any pattern in who they're targeting? Uh, is it, you know, individuals, particular age cohorts, small businesses, larger organisations, or all of them, all of the above? Look, I think it's just purely opportunity, opportunistic. Uh, the, the research also indicates that everybody is vulnerable to a scam, um, irrespective of your education level, where you live in Australia. Um, if you have a, uh, a, an email address, you have a mobile phone or a telephone, uh, you're likely to receive some sort of, uh, have some sort of interaction with a scammer at some point. Um, so that, that, that's the, the, the most interesting part of all of this is just how those scammers will interact and, and by telephone, uh, via SMS and via email are some of the most common. Mm. David, ID Care supports victims, people who have experienced some form of scam. How busy are you? Uh, Anna, very busy. We've already uh, seen a 47% jump in demand for our community services this calendar year, when we compare to last calendar year, which was the busiest year of record for us. Um, and I echo Matt's points. I mean, uh, Scamwatch losses reported and reports to Scamwatch itself this year has already surpassed 2020. So it is the busiest year on record. Scammers are making a fist of it. Um, and, and certainly our services are, are feeling that. David, something um, called Flubot um, hit Australian, sto Australian shores last month. Scamwatch has received thousands of complaints. Can you tell us what is Flubot and how does it work? Yeah, Flubot's a, a malware which is predominantly being communicated via SMS messages. Uh, it, it's an SMS message that many Australians have already received, millions of Australians, uh, that are prompting people to respond to a particular scam pretext. And 
And that could be impersonating large social media companies or, or uh, financial institutions. Um, the malware itself originated in the Northern Hemisphere a few months ago, so we've been keeping an eye on it. When, when users click on that link, uh, they are prompted to download what they think is an application relating to the deception. Uh, and once that application is downloaded, uh, it's impossible to remove unless you do a factory reset on the phone. It does target Android dev devices. It doesn't mean that iOS devices don't receive the scam message. Uh, but the actual scam itself then overlays on banking apps uh, so that when the consumer goes to open their banking app on their phone, they're actually entering the details uh, on the scammer's uh, app itself. I see. <laughs> Dangerous then. Uh, Matt, yeah. in the case of um, you know, products like or, or issues like Flubot and others, um, clearly telcos and VOIP providers have a role to play. But in your view, what can organisations do to help stamp these sorts of things out? Look, there's a lot that we can do. Collectively, uh, I think it's, it's not a law enforcement problem. We cannot arrest our way out of responding to scams. Um, uh, whilst we may endeavour to put people before the courts, but uh, it, that's one uh, avenue. But education is key. Every time we identify something like this, we need to make sure that the general population is, is aware. And there are just some of those essential, very simple rules is that some of you mentioned them uh, in your video. Um, it's about banks will not call you asking for your personal identification, making sure the general community understand that your name, your date of birth, where you live, email, that all has value to uh, criminals who wish to exploit you. Um, so it's lifting that level of literacy about scams and their prevalence and how they will uh, target you. Um, I think that's one of the big things that we really need to do collectively. Mm. I think you're certainly aware, um, Matt, but I might ask both of you this question, that um, banks have very sophisticated systems that alert mm. them to fraudulent activity. They're putting very big investments into this area. In fact, I'd venture to say that the, the protections that banks have and their ability to detect a scam as it's happening and instantly intervene to stop the customer's money going out of the account has probably saved you know, significantly more than the $850 million that's been lost. Mm. But that doesn't mean there's not a lot more that we could or should be doing. And obviously, uh, you know, educating customers about what banks will or won't do is one of those um, things that we can be doing more of and hence the campaign. But, you know, I'd be interested in your view and, and David's, um, you know, what else do you think the fin banking and finance industry could be doing? Um, you know, working with law enforcement or, um, you know, maybe be working with each other even. Mm. Um, oh, I'm, I'm happy to go first, uh, Mr Lacey. Uh, I think that collaboration, uh, the, the relationship between law enforcement, uh, from my perspective in New South Wales in particular, uh, and financial institutions has never been better. Um, we, we just need to seek out avenues to work together. There are some legislative hurdles there um, on both sides um, to that occurring, but uh, I, I just think whenever we identify scams and law enforcement has uh, benefited from the very sophisticated systems that uh, financial institutions have um, to monitor uh, fraud and scam activity, um, and it's about getting that data in a timely manner, and, and I think on occasions de-identifying it so that it can be pushed out to law enforcement and we're aware of trends uh, almost instantly uh, when they occur. But once again, I come down, whilst we can have all that technology, it's also very good to hear those examples on when the elderly attend a branch and they're subject of a scam, whether that be, you know, they're about to be arrested for unpaid tax, that that teller takes the time to ask the question and have that human touch um, to inquire as to why they're withdrawing out thousands of dollars and that's very uncharacteristic. So, you know, it's, it's a mix about how we respond. Mm. David, did you have a view on that, uh, that issue? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we do test responses of organisations uh, constantly at ID Care to make sure we're giving the right response advice to community members. Uh, and the banks are a standout in terms of response. They are um, a force to be reckoned with in terms of comparing how, how that industry looks and responds to these events against others and government. So I think that needs to be uh, highlighted. 
but there's always more you can do. And, and Matt, I think, makes a great point. Uh, banks and bank staff play a, an interventionist role in real time, uh, where uh, having staff who are armed with information on how to engage scam victims. I mean, these are tragic stories. These are stories where people's life savings evaporate. And, and there's plenty of examples at ID Care where bank staff have attempted to tell a customer that's a scam, but they've ignored them. They've find, found other ways to try and get money uh, to the scammer under the pretext. So keeping up training and awareness of, of, of staff at the front line is critical. I think there would be few examples, uh, if any now, where a scam impacting one institution does not impact other institutions. So the work that's been done within the industry to improve intelligence sharing is essential. And, and that intelligence sharing is not just, here's a, here's a scam account. That intelligence sharing needs to keep extending to these are the rules and the models that we use to apply and detect frauds on accounts and transactions. Um, we do see there is a difference between major banks and other banks on that front. So there's more ground to be made on there. Uh, and the third is, when you're a scam victim, I mean, we've been brought up in this country to think that a scam victim is someone who's fallen for a Nigerian prince email. And, and people are embarrassed and they feel silly. They don't want to talk about it. Uh, so doing events like this and saying we need to keep raising awareness, that actually starts in the home. And, and, it's, and, it, and it's on all of us to ensure that our parents and our brothers and sisters and children keep the conversation going, because that's not what the scammers want. They, they want people to feel embarrassed and not talk about it. And I think we all have that responsibility. Um, thank you. Um, I'm actually going to come back to you, Matt, on the issue around collaboration before we move on. But if I could just say that we will be breaking um, from my questions, uh, you know, in, in a little while and are throwing it open to the floor. So if anybody who's online wants to uh, ask a question, uh, can I ask you to use the chat function? When you do that, can you also include your name and the organisation that you're representing? So, um, Matt, I was interested in, um, you know, the point you made about just the power of collaboration across, you know, financial institutions and law enforcement agencies. Um, while we were waiting to go online, you were talking to me about a, an issue around mail fraud. Um, some time ago, and, and I think it was a great example and it might be useful, it might be interesting to share. Certainly, and, and when we talk about what banks can do, I think it's those industry bodies where we all get together, banks and law enforcement, and we discuss issues openly in a non-competitive environment. Um, I, I just recall sitting there at one of these meetings and all the banks were adamant that mail theft was an issue. Um, I was aware of it, but the New South Wales police statistics really didn't support that. So I indicated to the banks, well, if you would like me to do something about it, what data can you provide me? I need some proof that this is occurring. So uh, collectively, they all went away. And uh, within weeks, they sent me something back. Uh, and uh, it was overwhelming that there was an issue with mail theft. Uh, and more importantly, a police intervention um, was required. And what resulted from that was a strike force that was highly successful um, and we were able to dismantle that, uh, that particular serious and organised crime syndicate, which was operating in Sydney at the time, that was stealing mail um, for the purposes of committing fraud. So um, all of those people then would have been ringing Mr Lacey um, when they had their identity stolen. Um, but that is just one of the, the, the standout examples for me where banks held particular data um, that law enforcement weren't aware of, uh, they then shared that, and that in turn then prevented victims from being further victimised, and we were able to arrest and charge and completely dismantle a serious and organised crime syndicate. Um, thank you. It's a good reminder, uh, the power of collaboration. Uh, David, you, your organisation, ID Care, uh, as I said earlier, you work with people who have experienced not only scams, but uh, the theft of their identity. Um, can you take us through the consequences for someone when their identity is stolen? You know, clearly it's a, it must be a terrible experience, but actually it would be interesting, I think, for our audience to just understand the full impact and how that might play out over, you know, not just immediately, but perhaps over a longer period of time. Sure. I mean, we don't, 
we don't really see a distinction between scams and identity theft, sadly, now. Um, there's many scams lead to the harvesting of people's data uh, because there's secondary gain for the criminals in selling that information. So for, for about one in four Australians that reach into ID care in the last 30 days, uh, they were completely unaware of where the criminal got their data from. What they were experiencing was misuse. So that's the most common example that we have coming into ID care is what we call the nowhere customer. Uh, they have no idea how criminals use it. They, they're experiencing identity misuse because they might be getting a bill in the mail, they might be debt collectors coming to the door, they might be locked out of their uh, online account for whatever reason. Um, and so when they're in that situation, uh, there's really three kind of priority activities for them. One is detection. So they're playing a bit of a detective role in trying to understand, well, was it something I did? Was it something someone else did that, that allowed this information to get out there and, and be abused? They're doing a detection role in terms of, well, what information of mine was used to set up these accounts or access my accounts? That information is really critical for them to know because that influences what they do next. They, they, are, they are on a journey of protection. So they're really trying to protect their existing accounts. So talking to their banks, uh, talking to government and document issuers. Um, and they're also looking at protecting against the creation of new accounts. And there's a, there's a lot of effort and, and opportunity, I think, that, that's there in terms of, of banking industry collaboration as well. And then the third priority for these people is to, to correct what's going on. So to start the process of, of providing evidence to suggest that, well, it wasn't them, someone's running around with opportunity. And the orientation is very much on that, on that victim to do that work. For many people, that's not a journey that, that's over in 10 minutes. Uh, that's a journey that takes weeks and months. So when we talk customer friction, this is customer friction on steroids. Um, and for many, if it's a licence that's been compromised, then unfortunately at the moment, that's an enduring compromise for many. That's not something that's, that's not a risk that will be treated and, and be dealt with. It will be an enduring one for them. And I agree with David's comments there. Most of those people who are victims of identity crime, um, the consequences are significant. It's very different to other crime types where you may feel victimised for, you know, a matter of days, weeks perhaps, but for identity crime it's just different. It's, it's months and months of heartache for them in terms of recovering their identity um, and, and perhaps dealing with it. So it, it is, it has devastating consequences for individuals. Matt, um, you talked earlier, or I think David might have said something about, um, you know, sometimes banks try to warn customers and customers are, you know, particularly probably in romance um, scams, they're very determined to make mm. the transfer of the money or they're very emotionally attached to the whole story that they've been told. Um, you know, it, one of the, I think, uh, a law enforcement focus is making Australia obviously a hostile environment for scams and scammers. How do we balance that against um, victims who just want their money bank, money, money back and for the bank to refund them mm. versus if everything is automatically refunded, does that make mm. us a jurisdiction that's more attractive for scammers? Look, I think inevitably it will. Um, and individuals need to take responsibility um, for their actions on occasions. Um, you know, I think that the balance is always difficult in terms of um, deciding uh, what we're going to be doing and what banks do. But um, it's important that we don't... Uh, the automatic uh, play is just to simply refund. In, victims need to engage with law enforcement, make that report, and we are seeing incredibly high levels of uh, reporting right across uh, nationally, right across uh, Australia which is great. We've never seen that before, and I'd encourage that. Um, but we still need to make sure um, that individuals take responsibility uh, for, for their actions, and it comes down to that education component, saying, if you're prepared to click on that link or answer that phone call, uh, that there's a possibility here that you're highly likely that you will lose money. Um, but it, it's a very difficult uh, balance to strike. Mm. Do you have a view on that, David? Yeah, I think from our perspective, what we see at the moment is a lot of inconsistency in terms of regulatory response. So I think it would be a good thing for the market to have clarity and certainty as to where liability and risk is. 
I think it's it's a it is a it's deception and it's about the psychology of people's response and behaviour, and we see that every minute of the day here. Um, and it frustrates us as much as it frustrates others if you can't get the cut through to, to have the person come to the realisation that they are involved in something that's quite detrimental to them, but also their family. So I think the more clarity around that, the more, more ammunition that we can have in supporting each other and engaging people that are in this position, uh, the better it will be. Whereas I, I feel at the moment um, it's, it's a little unsettled. I know talking with industry members and others that, that it's quite variable. And of course, when we're in the frame of things in talking with people, they're equally you know, shifting blame to others when, when, when in fact maybe they're the ones who are responsible for it. And it's quite difficult without that clarity and certainty, I think. No, it's a, it's a really tough one, isn't it? When, particularly when someone's, you know, the consequences of the actions of the scammer and potentially some of the actions of the victim have devastating consequences for the victim. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's a very tough line to walk in terms of public policy. But David, uh, I understand that ID Care has a project at the moment on the most vulnerable postcodes in Australia. Um, so I'd be very interested to hear, firstly, a bit more about that project. And in your view, how can that help law enforcement and banks to mitigate scams? Yeah, thanks, Anna. Uh, it was a question that one of our team posed earlier this year, which was, what's the remotest postcode in the country? And, uh, and we looked at it. it was a, it's a small community in the Pilbara. Um, and we looked at our data of community uh, support and help and found that we'd had over 24 engagements from this one community in 18 months. And we thought, what, what is going on? You know, it was less than 100 people in this community. So we then looked at the data in terms of per capita, where reports were coming from. We then started to overlay that with, well, what are the conditions that are ripe for scamming and cybercrime and identity theft? You know, is, are there banks present? Are there, are there opportunities to buy cash vouchers? Are there, uh, is there likely to be inter interrupted internet? All the things that we know scammers use as part of their deception. And, and what came out was a scam vulnerability index, so an index that tells us really where are those communities in Australia uh, that, are, that are presenting as more vulnerable uh, than others. And, and when we look at that data, uh, that data uh, is, is pretty nuanced. It doesn't just say this is what we think a scam vulnerability is. It tells us the type of scams. You know, it tells us the, the channels that the criminals are using against the community. So in the, in the backdrop of this being ultimately the busiest year all of us in this industry of ours is having in relation to scams. Um, we, were, we, we really wanted to challenge ourselves and ask the hard question is, is our prevention and awareness working? If we're seeing this volume of, of scam scams grow and grow and grow. Um, and, and the idea behind it Anna, is, a, is a pretty simple one. It's, it's to have a community focused attention on prevention and awareness, not a not a slip, slop, slap, not a big national campaign that, that, that may not resonate at all with anyone in the Pilbara or the Arnhem Land or wherever it may be, uh, but to have a very concentrated uh, effort in, in, in really listening to communities, recruiting leaders within the communities that carry the conversation of the things that we all see impact communities in a way that will hopefully elicit the conversations people need to be having with family members and friends about being resilient. It's, it's a simple approach, but it's an approach that's very much empirically driven. Did you see, um, you know, in terms of the index, what are some of the observations that um, you might be able to share with the group? You know, different, are there different sort of scams that are more prevalent, for example, in regional areas than in densely populated urban areas? Is there a difference in vulnerability in different age cohorts, for example? Absolutely. So in some communities in the Territory, in remote communities, we're seeing a much greater prevalence of what we call money mulling activity. So this is where community members are being deceived to create accounts to launder money on behalf of organised crime. In other communities, for example, in the example of the Pilbara, uh, we saw investment fraud take hold. And what we find in smaller communities is that the things that work for scammers is where community members want to talk about 
the good thing they're on, whether it be an investment fraud or whatever it might be, and then it's almost like wildfire. It then catches on, and, and we find there's clusters of victims in communities. So that's, that's a tragic outcome, but it's also an opportunity for prevention. So if we apply the same tools as the scammers and look to create messaging that we hope will then catch on like wildfire, then we can play and defeat criminals at their own go. Uh, and so we do, definitely going back to your question, Anna, we are seeing uh, very specific communities being impacted by quite specific scams. It is influenced a bit by demographic, but it's influenced by other things as well, including the proximity of of things like financial institutions who offer that last line of defence, or police like Matt, who are constantly out there spreading the message. Uh, all of those things influence. And in some remote communities, we're seeing the prevalence three to four times higher per capita than we would see in metropolitan areas. Matt, do you think that an index like that can help law enforcement target you know, their activities? Look, absolutely. Um, if we had that data, we're then able to respond um, a little bit more t uh, some, with some tailored messaging. Uh, what we've identified quite clearly is that if a particular scam exists, there's not one method of communication that really does it all. If it's a particular, if it's a puppy scam, for instance, um, you know, so that responds well to social media. But if it's a scam that's targeting uh, the elderly and the ATO, uh, we need to change the way that we do things. And we do that all the time. And what we see is that the local media is often really successful at getting that message out. So we need to be very careful with our uh, campaigns that we run, um, that the prevention and disruption is targeted um, to that particular community that we're trying to really reach out to. Um, but that, that type of information is what I would, is gold for law enforcement. Mm. David, it, um, it strikes me as we're talking, David, that uh, a lot of banks would have um, their own information and be able to cut that by postcode, for example, and might be helpful for us to talk about how we could augment some of the work that you've done, because I think it would certainly help uh, banks in mitigating some of this activity. So a conversation for another time. Um, I might, I'm going to ask both of you, and I might um, start with you, David. What would you, or actually I might start with you, Matt. Um, what would you describe as Australia's, um, the most significant vulnerabilities that Australia has when it comes to cybercrime? Like, where do you see the sort of softness in our systems, if you like? Mm. Look, I think it's, it's a, look, it's a personal view, but I think Australians are very trusting. Um, if they pick up, a, if the phone rings, they're, they're able to, uh, you know, they want to talk to that individual, they don't want to be rude. Um, we are a very trusting society. So I think we need to be a little bit more suspicious of those individuals. Um, but as I said before, individuals don't understand the value of their of personal identification information. Um, and that they are just, they put it out everywhere. What's on social media, um, in terms of, uh, you know, you may fill out a competition. You need to think very carefully when you're, you know, providing your details, um, uh, whether that be your phone numbers uh, or whatever it is that you're doing. Where is that going? How is it going to be stored and for how long and who can access it? Um, so, and we're all increasingly connected. We're doing a lot more things online. Where there's a lot more electronic devices. Now with those devices come vulnerabilities. Um, and uh, fraudsters or scammers will always seek to exploit that. Um, and they will change. So they, when COVID hit, they were always after personal identification information, but instead of going through and saying they were from a bank uh, or Telstra, they then all of a sudden uh, were New South Wales Health and th those scams had a COVID-19 flavour about them. So they're very agile and very quick to adjust, but um, it, you know, it's a very interesting space to try and police. That is interesting. Um, uh, Australia, when it comes to digital banking uh, and the use of um, uh, new innovations and technologies in the payments system, so tap and go, for example, uh, app using apps for banking. Australia's, I, I think we're in the top three of the world in rapid and early adoption. Um, so it's interesting, in some ways it gives us access to much, much more convenient um, banking that's faster, easier, etc. Mm -hmm. But yes, it does make us more vulnerable. 
It does. And the trend, as I said, Australians are recognised as some of the earliest adopters and of new technology generally, and particularly in this finance sector. Um, and it's th that trend's been going for some time, but it's accelerated exponentially by the pandemic. People who were previously not using any form of digital banking, you know, almost had to because merchants stopped taking cash mm. and they had to start learning how to buy online. And so, yes, we've exposed to even more vulnerabilities potentially. But every year when Scam Watch, that Scam Watch report comes out, um, I look at it and I look at the figures and I think, well, just what are we doing? How can we do things differently? Because what we're doing now just simply isn't working. When the, the amount of funds that are lost due to scams, it's extraordinary. And it's it, the trajectory is just on its way up. Um, it's not even flattening. So it's something we need to be very conscious of. David, how would you describe um, the vulnerabilities in an Australia? Where do you think Australia's particular vulnerabilities might be. Do you, do you agree with Matt that maybe um, culturally we're a trusting group? Oh, we definitely are. I mean, we're in the top five countries, I think, that are targeted by scammers uh, globally. Um, look, I think there's a few things. One, and this is more a global market view, when we consume security or when we consume IT products or applications or, or hardware, often they're not set by default at the right security measure and condition. So if you get an email account, quite often it's not by default set at a two-factor authentication. So I think, I think there's a step we can make in that direction to kind of almost by default set the security to levels that they need to be when we're consuming those products. Um, I think Matt's spot on. I mean, this is, a, this is about a conversation, an ongoing conversation and dialogue that we have with family and friends around the importance of our information and our security. Um, and, and we should not at all relax on that front. Uh, I have a mother, I have a mother-in-law who've fallen victim to scams, uh, who've been scam victims in, uh, twice in the last two years. And they're the, they're the relative that always texts me saying, here's another scam number I got, Dave. So um, if, if they're falling victim, uh, and I'd like to hope that they're more resilient than others, there's a scam for every one of us, Anna, and, and we've got to keep that conversation going. That's a credit to you guys for having this event. Well, that's not a very cheerful thought, um, but a good reminder to us to be, be on the lookout ourselves. We've got a couple of questions here from some of our audience members, and I might just turn to those now. Um, Paige from ING Bank um, has asked, can we confirm in regards to like ID theft um, and other stuff, what are the best preventive, me preventative measures that we can assist with our clients in putting in place? So. I think, you know, Paige is really seeking in the views of people like yourselves who see this all the time. Um, you know, Paige is working in a bank. What things can she do with her customers? Um, advice can she give to them to put in place, um, either at the bank end or the customer end? So three things from my, my perspective. One is to ensure there's a good mix of passwords happening in all of our accounts, whether it be personal or, or business. And, and the extension of that to password management, if you like. Multi-factor everything you possibly can uh, is, is another piece of advice that I know would have saved a lot of people that have come to, uh, to ID care. And, and, and make sure that you are, as we've been talking about in this session, positioning yourself as the bystander that's there to have the conversation with someone who's about to react and respond to a message that they've just received to say, hey, let's just take a break and and think about what we're doing. Scammers don't want that. And, and I think there's a good opportunity for all of us to play that role. Matt? Look, look it comes down to, to how these scammers are actually interacting with our victims. Um, and, and it's about talking about, well, if you receive that phone call, don't click on that link, don't respond to that email. Um, and that, uh, you know, if you are asked for, a, uh, for some confidential information from somebody you don't know and can't identify, we'll be suspicious and politely decline. Is it's interesting, isn't it? If you, if you, as you outlined earlier in your view, that the, the level of trust in Australia might in fact be one of the things that exposes us, but you don't really want us to become a distrustful people. You know, you've got to find the right balance of trust and, you know, when to trust and when to question. 
Th that's right. Mm. But I, it's that comes down to that core component: is that legitimate organisations will not call you, will not reach out to you via any means, and ask for your confidential information. Mm. But we do know that, particularly, um, you know, some of the like the ATO one that says, or the AFP, you know, I'm ringing you because you haven't paid your tax debt, and we're going to arrest you. You know, they use two things. It seems to me either they're trying to charm you into trusting them and doing what they want, or they're actually quite threatening and intimidating. Mm. And I've certainly seen in my own family, they're very pushy, and it's you sort of pushed into something. Um, Look, absolutely, and the, the scammers respond, um, and they can be use those high pressure tactics. They will make you, they will want you to make quick decisions. They will want to keep you on the phone at all times. Um, so it can be very difficult. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, we've got someone here, we've got Tom um, Eagledon, who is from the office of Stephen Jones, who's the Shadow Minister for Financial Services. And Tom is asking, um, he's interested to hear from both Matt and Dave as to whether there's a better way for victims to regain their ID once it has been stolen. I think, I suspect Stephen's probably thinking, sorry, that um, Tom is probably thinking from, you know, is there, uh, is there legislative measures we could do? Is there something that the parliament should be turning its mind to. But, you know, don't restrict yourself to that either. I can go first if you like, Matt. I think, um, Tom, thanks for the question. Um, at the moment, there is uh, a lot of inconsistency around governments on how they treat the exposure and misuse of government-issued credentials. So uh, we've been very, very lucky in the last 12 months to have Transport for New South Wales change their policy, and that's courtesy of work that I know New South Wales Police and ID Care have been doing uh, in, in convincing for that policy change. Uh, so you don't have to wait for your stolen New South Wales licence details, not just the card, but the details, to then be misused in other crimes, to then try and get a court certificate to, to hopefully get your licence changed. It was a terrible process. It was a process that led to almost no uptake uh, and, and it basically created an enduring risk to the identity system. Now, that's all changed and, and you don't have to wait for another crime to be committed and you can get a police report number and a few other things and you're away. It's a lot, lot simpler process. But that's only in New South Wales. In, in Queensland uh, and Victoria, even though there is some glimmer that that can happen, it's a process that's still so fraught with danger for the victim, it's almost impossible to do anything about it. In the ACT, Western Australia and Northern Territory and Tasmania, you can't. So that, that's an example of, of inconsistency. And ultimately, what that's doing is creating greater vulnerabilities in our identity system. I think the thing that we're most animated about at the moment in ID care is speed. Criminals are much more agile than our organisations will ever be. So the response that we, we need to take when these events happen need to be as, as speedy, if not speedier, in protecting banks and in protecting industry and government and ultimately the consumer. So, so we would like to see a lot more effort and energy on the identity system being receptive to signals as soon as these things happen uh, so that when they're received, prevention can be put in place and signals back to the consumer to say, you've got a Westpac bank or you've got a NAB account or you've got an ING account. Is this correct? Yes or no? And if it's a no, another signal goes out. That's how the system can be a lot more resilient. And I think really that calls for a national strategy in relation to uh, how we respond to these things. That, that I think is a missing pillar. Matt, did you have something to add to that? Look, I agree with Dave there. And as an example of that, when you're talking about being more responsive, um, in terms of a collaborative approach with law enforcement nationally in relation to business email compromises, it's about making sure and notifying financial institutions that a company has been a victim to stop that fun to stop those funds. So it's about freezing it. So as soon as law enforcement, how, however it's reported, whether it comes through Report Cyber or directly into a police station, is that there's that immediate notification, um, and that individuals are told that there's some money and that the movement is has occurred, 
and freezing it. Now, that's not part of it. It's not a, it's not a judicial notice. So it's, it's sort of done just on the basis of information sharing and to prevent victimisation. Um, that's that's at its core, that particular um, program in relation to business email compromises. And it has saved millions of dollars from leaving Australia. Mm. Um, well, I think quite a few things to think about there, so thank you. Uh, we have uh, another question from Kyla Bartlett. Kyla uh, works at ASIC uh, as one of our regulators, and she's asking, um, what sort of disruptive or educational actions would you like to see more of from regulators in relation to scam activity? So I don't know if you've got a view about what more regulators could be doing. I don't think, um, well, obviously Kyla's interested from an ASIC perspective, but I don't think she would expect you restrict your answer to that. There might be other regulators you've got a view on. I probably have one view. Is I think uh, whilst I'm res I understand the need for privacy, I, I really do. Um, but where there's opportunities to prevent victimisation and information can be shared at a de-identified level, which will assist everybody in target hardening your customers or assisting law enforcement to achieve a particular goal. Um, regulators should be open to perhaps uh, working with uh, all industries to achieve that. So it is about preventing victimisation. Dave, did you have David? Did you have any observations? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I think um, we've seen a legislative trend over the last decade towards placing the onus on regulated entities to, to formulate their own view on risk and apply risk treatments. And I think it's to an extent that's a sensible uh, direction, but there's a caveat. If you're a regulator or an intelligence agency in government and you have a view of the market and its risk that is not being shared with regulated entities, then that proposition is quite fraught. So I think there's an opportunity for regulators to really think about the view that they have of the risk and how they can better share that view of risk uh, with regulated entities. So that's one point. I think uh, ASIC, in terms of money smart, I know we're advocates when people come to ID Care and they may experience an investment fraud or intent investment fraud to get onto money smart. Um, there is an opportunity to further enhance Money Smart and its scam awareness by, by tapping in more readily to IOSCO, the International Security Committee Organisation, um, who have aggregated all the scam data from around the world of ASIC equivalents offshore. I mentioned before, speed is everything. Speed is everything. And, uh, and, and by having something like Money Smart and scam alerts, uh, put that on steroids. And, and get much more uh, a timely uh, scam alerting that leverages the international uh, regime, I think would be a good step as well. Um, thanks. Just before I go to the next question, I might just go back. There was a question, and I'm not sure whether it was a second question from Paige, but it was um, a, a question added at the end of hers uh, about whether or not we're looking, um, and I suspect she means the banking industry, whether we're looking at adopting universal fraud and scam rules across all financial institutions to ensure a consistent approach. And I might answer that a little bit, Paige, but I'm also raising it in the context of ASIC asking um, about what more regulators could be doing. I, I do think, I mean, we know that there is just enormous amounts of work being done and huge investments going on from banks, uh, but I don't think what, I don't think we have a consistent view that I can feel or see from regulators and banks themselves um, and maybe even to some extent sort of the policy making heart of government, you know, in Treasury or somewhere that says, you know, we, we need more consistency, um, that there ought to be some really well understood things from customers about, you know, when they will be liable, when banks will be liable, what are the sorts of things that customers you know, need to be doing to protect themselves. You know, I do think that there is a role to be played here, potentially, um, you know, by uh, regulators working together and with the industry to say, where does it now make sense for us to be doing more on a consistent basis? And ASIC at the moment is consulting on the e-payments code, so there's a real opportunity, whether it's in that code or in another vehicle, um, I think, to have that conversation. So. I just wanted to tie that back to that answer. But we've got another question here from Josh, uh, Josh Nast at Westpac. 
who acknowledges that making the Australian community a harder target um, for scammers is always challenging. But he asks this question, do we need more coordinated federal level initiatives like the Clean Pipes Consortium, whereby organisations can register their numbers and telecommunications providers will block traffic at the network level that is not white listed? Um, Matt, I might start with you. I'm not sure if you're aware of this issue. This is not one I'm familiar with, but it sounds interesting. Look, I'm not exactly familiar with that, but I think uh, from my perspective, from a law enforcement perspective, um, we need to be engaging more with the telecommunications providers, the ISPs, um, so that we can really leverage off those opportunities to uh, prevent and disrupt. Uh, we have a lot of data, we collect a lot of data that indicates particular phone numbers um, and so does Mr Lacey in terms of you know, how these people are being victimised but we need to be doing something more constructive with that information. David, did you um, have anything to add, yeah. particularly in relation to that clean pipes issue? Yeah, Josh, Josh really highlights the opportunity that presents that if we've got a cybercrime or a scam that's predominantly happening from offshore, which they are, uh, then let's work upstream a bit more and see how we might be able to prevent these communications from hitting the community at large uh, when those offshore are looking at targeting us. So Telstra, as an example, reported a few weeks back that they're blocking around 13.5 million scam calls a month. So, and that's in the month when we're all seeing an escalation of those calls that are actually making it through. So. Uh, they're blocking those calls because they're targeting uh, upstream. They're looking at blocking things before they're coming through. Josh is alluding to the fact that there's an opportunity uh, for some federal coordination here in aggregating data that Matt talks about in seeing whether we can block things moving forward in a lot more timely way and much more upstream before it actually hits our devices. So I think that's a, it's an excellent idea and one that we'd certainly be behind. Which I think goes to some um, some way to answering the next question, which is from um, Leo uh, Pierotti in Macquarie Bank, uh, acknowledging that mobile phones are typically the primary vehicle for scams um, via the delivery of phishing text messages um, to victims and security codes from banks. It would appear that uh, you know Josh make uh, sorry Leo makes the point that it would appear that collaboration between banks and law enforcement is working well. How can we go about getting the telco sector more involved? Um, it sounds to me, David, that you know the telco sector is very aware of their, the part they play here. Do you think there are things that we can be doing to get them more involved? Oh, most definitely. I mean, it's, a, it's an interdependency that the, both banking industry and telecommunications have of each other. And uh, it's taken a good few years, but it's good to see that they're now uh, starting to do things about it. Andy Penn at Telstra has certainly taken the lead from their industry's perspective. Um, uh, telecommunications is going to be increasingly the key for all of us into the future. So the more innovation and thinking that we can do around uh, intervening at that, at that industry early, the better. Um, the banks have had a bit of a bad rap over the years but when you think of it, that's kind of the last line of a long conga line of things that criminals do before they get the money. So, so our thinking also needs to shift upstream, and that's what Josh alludes to, and obviously Leo as well. Mm. Um, a question here from um, Rob, again um, from ING Bank. And, you know, I th it, this is interesting if you've got any data on this, whether it's maybe start with you, Matt. How many scams are coming from within Australia versus overseas? Like, what is the sort of rough divide? Is it 50-50, 90-10? What's your sort of sense in terms of what you're seeing? Look, look it's difficult in New South Wales with the breakdown, um, with the report cyber system that, that we have, which is a national system, um, to be able to adequately um, probably answer that question. But what we can, what we do see is that you'll see scams that occur overseas will eventually in some way come to Australia. So we do see that movement um, of scams, and that's particularly with a lot of cybercrime as well. Uh, ransomware may be popular over there, and then it, all of a sudden it will, will appear in Australia. So um, I don't have exact um, percentages or figures there for that, but um, you know it, it's certainly um, a, an issue. We, we do know a lot of offenders are, are domiciled uh, offshore. David, do you have any insights on that breakdown? Yeah, when we 
when we review our cases, I, I, I'd hazard a guess that 90 plus percent originate from offshore. And, and we, we look at things such as where money has been transferred to or where we think calls have originated from as indicators of that. Um, but that it, it's, it's, I think, a wrong thing to think that it's exclusively offshore because those that are committing these crimes offshore, as Matt knows, also rely in part on people that may well be residing here that are enabling these crimes domestically. So, um, so it's important not to say it's offshore and onshore. I think there's a mix of both, but, but certainly we see the origins uh, predominantly coming from offshore. And an example of that would be business email compromises, where the individual who's actually, uh, you know, perpetrating the e business email compromise may well be offshore. But certainly, what we find is the mules, the people that are accepting the money in the first instance, they're they're onshore. They're in Australia. Right. Um, another part of Rob's question was, who is the appropriate authority to report and investigate these matters, and are they um, adequately resourced? Um, oh, look, I'm happy to, to, to go first with that. I thought uh, you'd like to jump into that one. Look, law enforcement um, nationally, I think, has ramped up its response to fraud and cybercrime um, right across the, the nation. Um, sure enough, there's differences, there's nuances between each of the jurisdictions. Uh, we now have Report Cyber, which is a Commonwealth uh, online portal to report matters. Um, and that's working well. For, for the very first time, uh, law enforcement is getting the, uh, a national picture um, of what's occurring in this particular space in relation to fraud, uh, ransomware, romance scams, all of that. It's all, it all can be reported centrally. And the benefits of that is that you then get that ability to look at that data nationally and work out where the links are. Um, we could always do with more resources, but I think, you know, New South Wales, uh, the government has... Um, it, Invested heavily uh, in cybercrime. We're the only we have. We're the only ones that have a dedicated cybercrime squad. Um, so you know, we're uh, we're certainly punching above our weight in terms of arrests and charges for this year. Um, David, did you want to add anything to that? Sure do. Um, look, I think I think there needs to be a lot more resourcing. I think the reality is, and notwithstanding Matt men mentioned, you can't arrest your way out of it. I think that's a fair point there still needs to be disruption. You know, there still needs to be a deterrence and, and we need to celebrate it when that happens. So Matt is not out of work. It's not like Matt doesn't have anything to do. Um, and, and I would expect that whether it be ID Care uh, reports or Report Cyber or Scamwatch, maybe hazarding a guess that we, we, we'd get a successful outcome in less than 10% of the time. Um, the rest is, is volume. The rest might be origi originating from offshore. When we look at what's going on around the world in terms of intervention and response, there is a move towards a much tighter and much more coordinated centralisation of resources across jurisdictions and industry. So we tried a few things a few, few, few years ago. We we're probably ahead of our time. I think it's now time to revisit that. I think having New South Wales police, who are leaders in this space, uh, and I'm not just saying that because Matt's there, we get a lot of value in our time in engaging with New South Wales police. Uh, but I think it's time to revisit that and see what, what capabilities can be brought across government and industry to a problem in a much more coordinated way. That, that's what the times call for now. And I'd love to see that. I completely agree. The opportunities to prevent and disrupt in this particular space are endless, and we are certainly not taking, uh, you know, really using that to the full extent. So I completely agree with David there. Great. Look, we've got another question here from Fiona O'Sullivan at the University of Sydney Business School. It's a very practical question, and she's asking, when we receive a scam call and we then block that call, does it actually prevent us being scammed? Well, what it does is just prevent you from interacting with that particular individual. And, and you know, we just need to be upfront um, and not interact with these individuals. That's probably one of the best ways that you'll prevent yourself from being scammed. It does mean, unfortunately, they may well just move on to the next number um, and try. And it is a name of gum, uh, uh, it's a game of numbers. So they will make, you know, a thousand calls a day. Um, but, uh, you know, by all means, hang up that phone. Don't respond to that particular text message.
Good advice. Um, Jenny Lyons from ASIC, another practical question, um, and one I think all of us grapple with all the time. How do we balance the need to have multiple strong passwords with our inability to remember them? How secure are password managers? Are they safe? David, do you have a view? Uh, nothing's 100% foolproof, um, but but we, we would advocate for certainly password managers for the very reason you state. I mean, I can't remember all my passwords. And, and the longer and the more complex the password, the less likely it's going to be hacked. Um, so so um, we, we certainly at, at ID Care advocate to the community that they should investigate password managers uh, for that reason. Great, thanks. Um, now, this, I mean, this is my la the last question I'm going to take. It's from Rizwan at Arab Bank. What are the obligations of the receiving bank? If an account is opened fraudulently or legitimately for that matter, and fraud has been perpetrated, does the receiving bank have any liability? Matt, do you have a view on the law around this? Look, it's a bit of a legal question, and, I, and I'm not a lawyer, but what I can say is that there's mechanisms for that, in that particular account to be reported, um, you know, via the internal means, and I'd encourage that particular employee that's working at the bank, if they identify that, to report it via their internal mechanisms. Yeah, I suspect the answer probably depends on the circumstances in which um, that, that surround the particular account. Um, but I've got, um, we're about to run out of time and I've got one last question for both of you and that is, what's one piece of advice that you would give all of us? Matt. One piece of advice. Um, uh, look, I think that would be, um, you know, don't provide confidential information to people you don't know and that you cannot identify. Um, that's, as a basic rule, that, that's what I'd, if we could spread that message, um, I think we could uh, go some way to preventing some of these scams. David. Uh, it's everyone's responsibility. So let, let's keep discussing and, and keep talking to loved ones and friends about this. Great, both of you. Um, can I say on behalf of uh, everybody who's, been, um, join, who's joined us online this afternoon, a very, very big thank you uh, to both of you for sharing an hour with us. I think you can see from the questions there's, there's a lot of discussions happening in banks, a lot of bank staff very interested um, in what they can do to disrupt, prevent, protect customers. Uh, bank staff often seen, see the tragic um, results uh, when people are um, unfortunately the victim of a scam and it can have devastating life impacts for them. So, uh, you know, banks, on behalf of the industry, I say to both of you, banks um, stand ready to do what we can and to continue, continue to improve. And I think there's certainly been um, some food for thought and some ideas uh, for me out of the session uh, about how um, the Australian Banking Association can work with our members to think about what the next steps might be. And I think, uh, David, you said earlier, you know, the, the times are now demanding, you know, more of all of us. And um, I think that, uh, that yeah, there's, there's plenty of uh, out of the session today that uh, can give us some directions that we can take in consultation with, um, with the parliaments, um, state and federal, with regulators, uh, and with ourselves and each other. And uh, I thank, um, f thank you for giving us that food for thought. Um, no doubt we'll be talking to you again about ways that Australia's banks um, can play a really constructive role uh, and do what they can to better protect everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you to everybody who's joined us this afternoon. Thank you for taking an interest. I know, um, I know everyone is sick to death of looking at a screen uh, and uh, we very much appreciate the fact that you've taken another hour of your day to be in front of a screen to think about these issues. Um, you saw from the data I introduced the session with, this is something that is affecting so many Australians and we've heard today, unfortunately, an increasing number of Australians. So thank you for taking the interest. I look forward to working with you and your banks uh, over the coming months uh, and uh, over the next 12 months particularly to think more carefully and consistently about what more we can be doing. Thank you.